Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. So, we're pirates now. First of all, before we start, I have to say that I absolutely love the theme of this season. It feels like Bungie is having a whole lot more fun with the season's narrative, and after the rather emotionally weighted season of The Haunted, it's nice to have the Drifter come in through the door and basically go, Hey, kid, you want to do some crime? It's, it's good old fun seasons in Destiny, and I love that. Anyway, today we're going to go and give a brief little introduction to the main focus of the season as far as the faction we're fighting with and against is concerned, and that's talking all about the Fallen and their history of piracy. So buckle up, things are going to get pretty wild today. Before we begin, I think it's really worth talking about the separation of the terms Fallen and Elixni. The word Fallen is really a human slur, but it's one of the many that the Elixni have begrudgingly sort of accepted in many cases. Not all of them, but many of them accept the idea that they have indeed fallen from grace. The separation of the terms Elixni and Fallen is important because the Elixni in the days before their apocalyptic scenario, aka the Whirlwind, could definitely not be described as Fallen. They were noble, majestic, and kind. Whereas the Fallen are predatory and ruthless and brutal. So if I use the terms differently, there is often a reason for it. Elixni often refers to the ancient past and the potential future of the species, whereas the term Fallen is more present and recent past based. So just keep that in mind as I go forward. Oftentimes when I use the two words they are interchangeable, other times when I use the two words there is a very specific reason why I'm saying Elixni as opposed to Fallen, or Fallen as opposed to Elixni. With all of that out of the way, let's talk briefly about the Whirlwind because it really was that big moment that brought this change from the Elixni to Fallen into being. When the Witness and the Black Fleet of Pyramid Ships arrived at Reese, the Elixni homeworld, they were abandoned by the Traveler. This was essentially a near death knell for their species and led to the greatest division between the houses that had ever been known. According to Namrask in the Achilles Weaves a Cocoon lore book, there was a moment at which there was a division where the former Kells, led by Chelchis, the Kell of Stone, fought back against the likes of Oryx and the Witness at Reese. And then there were the other houses that did not do so and chose to go on a great diaspora all the way on a long trek from Reese to Sol in search of the Traveler. It's out here in the cold and the darkness of space that the Elixni really became the Fallen with ether, the gaseous compound that the Elixni require to live, becoming a scarce resource, it suddenly became apparent that the houses would need to compete with each other over resources generally. Where once there was prosperity, now there would be violence. It's because of this terrible need to survive that the Elixni fell from grace and the Fallen were truly born. When Bungie first described the Fallen at the very beginning of Destiny 1 in their marketing terms, they used the term Spider Pirates. This isn't just fitting, it's also accurate. The various cast members from the Season of the Plunder will tell you just this in the Seasonal Armors lore tab, which is some of the most interesting because it offers a varied number of perspectives on the same topic, the original Elixni crews that were formed out in the days between arriving at Sol and leaving Rhys. Ever since the Fallen have done this, there have been many different perspectives that evolved, but all of them have this same skewed idea of survival, and the idea of whether it's needed now or not is realistically what varies. The different perspectives shown in the Seasonal Armor come from Ido, Mithrax, the Spider, the Drifter, and Eremis, and all of them are pretty varied and some of them, well, they miss the truth or the bigger point to it all. I think it's only when you look at them in combination that you can really get a true idea of what's going on with the Elixni back in the day and how they fell towards becoming the Fallen. So we're going to go through each of them, and we're going to start with that of the spider. Take a listen. What's that, Guardian? You want to hear about the old crews from someone who was there? You think I was around for the whirlwind? <laughs> I'm a few malts shy. No, I hatched into the House of Wolves. You know the story, and if not, I don't have time to explain it to you. But I trade in information. I ran with some tough crowds in the past. Maybe knew someone who knew someone. You get the idea. So I know a fair bit about those crews. For them, every path of ether came at someone's expense. Your best bet was to be stronger than the next crew over, and when things were especially bad, stronger than whoever was in the next cot to yours. So they got strong. 
And remember, they didn't have void or solar like you do. They had claws and blades. When they killed, it was without hesitation. And when they died, there was no coming back. You guardians, with your little ghosts hovering nearby, you have the luxury of kindness. That was never an option for the old crews. They were like anyone else. They were cruel. But you needed to be cruel to survive in those days. And they're not back, like I hear Mithrax saying. They never left. You're up against the ones who stayed alive all this time. The ones who learned how to survive, how to sacrifice, how to take what they need, whatever the cost. And speaking of costs, I'm not seeing any more glimmer in your account. I think we're done talking. Spider's perspective on the old crews is very much one that revolves around the brutal need to survive. He doesn't think of it as barbaric, he thinks of it as necessary. In that zero-sum game that followed in the wake of the whirlwind, the Fallen's practices of cutthroat survivalism were perhaps the only way that people could reasonably continue to live. To the spider, he sees that the Fallen have always been this way ever since the whirlwind. He sees that it is still happening now. For him, the simple accomplishment of survival acts as a warning. The crews that are now left fighting are the toughest in the entire system because they know how to sacrifice. They will take no prisoners and give no quarter because that's how they best know how to survive. And they are very good at surviving. Next up, we have Ido's much more scholarly perspective. Take a listen to this. The old crews. Yes, I have gathered much information about them in the past weeks. In fact, I've just finished going over my notes. The old crews rose in the wake of the whirlwind during what we Elixney refer to as the Long Drift, the span of time between the fall of Rhys and our arrival in the solar system. I believe the equivalent period would be your Dark Ages, though Rhys did not have Risen or Iron Lords. Instead, we had the crews. As you can imagine, this period was quite lawless, as the stability and abundance of Rhys was no more. This resulted in what I believe is called a zero-sum game, a situation in which every gain or advantage is earned at the expense of another. Several fearsome individuals rose to great power and authoritative prominence at that time. The Elixni word for them translates to catch killer, meaning one who boards and rests control of enemy ships. These catch killers commanded great fleets and raided many supply routes, procuring objects of historic or intrinsic value along the way. It is exciting to wonder what treasures they accumulated beyond those we've recovered already. Many crews were abolished or disbanded over time, but those that survived did so through great hardship. They are formidable indeed. But then, so is the Vanguard and its guardians. Thank you for asking about my research into the old crews and their significance. It is always a pleasure to talk about it. After all, what use is knowledge if it is not shared? The key things we learn here from Ido are really those that stand within the cultural memory of the Fallen. The period of time when the crews formed, being known as the Long Drift, makes a great degree of sense, given how directionless and slow and hopeless everything must have felt at the time. Remember that this might have gone on for centuries because they didn't arrive during the Golden Age, they arrived at the end of it, during the Collapse. The rise of the Catch Killers makes an important degree of sense and also points out an important cultural facet to this period of time. I think it's not uncommon for the term Kel, aka the leaders of each fallen house, and the term Catch Killer to be mixed up in these times. Whilst there is a distinction drawn later on between the crews and the houses by Mithrax, the houses often devolved into crews just in the same way the Elixni devolved into the Fallen. So it's perhaps not so unheard of to see some of the greatest Kells turn into the greatest Ketch Killers. Remember that the Fallen poetry of old, particularly that that you can see within the Prophecy of the Kell of Kells, describes how all other Kells and all other Ketches will kneel to him and follow his command, therefore implying that Whoever does become the Kale of Kells is in fact going to be the one that is in command of the entirety of the Elixni fleets. This is something which ultimately points towards this idea that Ketch Killers embodied that sort of might of right and truly were another part of the zero-sum game that defined the Fallen's existence at this time. Also remember that it was the Kells that historically not only commanded the houses, but also distributed ether, and so the prize catches and hauls of things 
especially considering the way that ether ciphers work, were often going to be the important part of any particular Kel's authority. This is something, of course, they would do with the assistance of Prime Servitors and the Archons that communed with them, but the authority is still something that lies with the Kells. Although again, it's impossible to say that they ever had full authority when part of that leading triumvirate was also there to keep them in check. Although, let's be realistic for a second here, the Kells were despots, and despite the existence of some kind of ruling trio, they were still predominantly going to be the ones in charge even if there are little bits of minutia that need to be taken into account. To be a successful Fallen in the time of the Great Drift means that you would have had to be part of one of the catch-killing Kells crews. Try saying that five times fast. Next up, we have the perspective of the Drifter, something that adds a bit more of a human face to it. The old crews? Ain't much I can tell you that you couldn't get from Rahul, but I can't blame you if you'd rather stay awake for the whole story. <laughs> Come on, loosen up, hero. If you think a grim expression is all it takes to move up through the vanguard, well, you may have something there. Okay, I'll start at the beginning. The Traveler chose the Elixni, and everything was great over in Reese. Until it wasn't. The whirlwind happened, the pyramids showed up, the Traveler took off through space, and from what I gather, it wasn't a pretty scene. Eremis was there for it, and credit where it's due, she picked herself up, grabbed a crew, and went off to the Traveler. She cut through everything in her way, dead set on hunting it down. And she wasn't the only one with that idea. Whole fleets of ships chased the Traveler. Lawless days. Hopeless days. See, I was there for the Dark Ages. And when there's nothing but loss around you planetside, you can still find a rooftop, sit in a snowfield. You can go into a forest and find a moment of quiet. A little scrap of peace. Ain't like that on a ship. Things go from bad to worse, you just have to face it. And Aramis did. That takes a gut full of grit. Now, don't think I'm writing love poems to the ship stealer over here. We find her, I'm drawing down quick as you are. But if the big old traveler blasted out of the sky tomorrow, you bet your entire vault we'd chase after it. We'd be the new crews, going after something we knew in our bones was ours, not stopping for anyone or anything that got in our way. And we'd still think ourselves as heroes wouldn't we? In a strange way, here the Drifter shares Spider's perspective, but also really humanizes the Fallen. Survival is paramount to everyone, including the Elixni, in those days of the Long Drift. And it's something that the Drifter understands, and you know what? It really is a human thing as much as it's an Elixni thing. So much as they may have become the Fallen and endured great hardship during the Long Drift, it's something that perhaps we can understand, because if we were also put in that same perspective, well, we would be doing the same thing too, wouldn't we? They are perhaps only villains to us because they were on the other side of the coin. Speaking of villains, let's see what Aramis had to say. We are raiders and cutthroats, killing each other for bare survival. But what else could we have become? You can't speak of us, the old crews and their infamy, without speaking of the whirlwind. Like hatchlings chittering for their mother, we were abandoned. Weak. Left to die. You all know what came after. We lived. We lived, and all we had were our lives. Great houses fell, and from their ruins rose the crews. We followed the traitor machine to this system, and found the humans just as soft and weak as we had been as reliant, helpless, and blind as the machine had made us. But the humans had taken it from us, and so they would pay with everything they had. And now? Now we remain where others have failed. Enemy ships quiver at the sight of our banners. They break against our hulls. And when we pick them clean of all they have, we find other prey and do the same. We know the truth in this system. We are only a strong, as those we kill. Now granted, I'm assuming this is Aramis, given that it doesn't actually say it was her, that is an assumption, but I think it's a very fair assumption considering the use of the term traitor machine referring to the Traveler, and the fact that this comes from a House of Salvation catch in the Themis cluster. So yeah, almost certainly this was Aramis. Aramis's beliefs in the brutalism of the time of the Whirlwind do mirror that of the Spider and the Drifter, but she perhaps fails to recognize the key difference between those days of the Long Drift 
And now, now the Elixni have a choice of how they can exist. Cutthroat zero-sum games were the way of the past between Reese and Earth and the long drift between. But now, they're in Sol. Their world and their options are wider. This is now something that I think she fails to understand, but I think it's clear that Mithrax has grasped this idea, and he has come to believe in it wholeheartedly. In fact, it's the entire guiding principle of the House of Light that the Elixni do not need to be the Fallen any longer. This is his perspective, the last one that we'll be exploring today. What makes a house? It is a good question, and one that many Elixni do not think on often enough. For humans, a house is a place, but for Elixni, a house is a family. It has a culture, a philosophy of living, shared by all. That is why the House of Light survived, even when we fled Europa. Even after the ship stealer took all we had, we were bound not by place or possessions, but as family. Cryptarch Matsuo asked me why the old crews are not considered houses. It is a wise question, one that perhaps does not have a singular answer. I think it is because those who led the old crews did not wish to be true Kells. A Kell is responsible for the safety and prosperity of their house. It is an honor and a burden. Those you call pirate lords wish only to take. They give nothing, even to their own people. Each raider is responsible only for themselves. A crew is expendable. A family is not. The old crews lived a sad life. One best left in the past. It's good to understand the distinction between the fallen houses of old and the fallen crews that were born out of the long drift. Even if some of them did eventually fashion themselves back into houses, they were still not truly the houses of old that could be seen on Reese. They were instead parodies of them. Nobility dressed in pirate clothing, thugs and bandits that played as knights and warriors. They were different. They had changed from the Elixni to the Fallen, and they had to because that was the means of their survival. But Mithrax has grasped a very important point. They no longer need to be that. The crews of the houses can turn back into families now, and Mithrax has made exactly this effort. Mithrax has pointed out something so important that Aramis has not yet grasped. I can only imagine what Aramis's old mate Arthris would have to say at what she's done to the Elixni under her command, and how she has turned to survival at any cost. She has forgotten the meaning of family. Maybe one day she will remember it. But Mithrax has not, and that perhaps is the most defining difference between his House of Light and the crews of old that turned into the houses that we would know in Sol. However, that's all from me today. We will have more lore on the Elixni, the Fallen, the change between the two of them, the pirate houses, the different pirate lords that we'll be fighting. All of this information is going to come out as this season progresses, and I can't wait to share it all with you. It's going to be amazing fun. So, with all of that said, go ahead and leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and if you want more Destiny lore content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But, as per usual, know that your viewership is quite enough for me, and that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.